Hi guys, I'm Dana Shank. I have been in the marketing and digital world for, gosh, over about 20 years. Um, most recently, I've been consulting, um, just spent some time at PepsiCo on the North American Nutrition Brands. Um, prior to that, I did some work with Kellogg's, evaluating their loyalty program um, and that digital platform. Um, and before that, I spent many years at Kraft Heinz, where I oversaw our CRM and content marketing platform, all of our digital marketing and our social intelligence efforts. Um, but before that, I spent a number of years agency side, which is where I met each of these lovely ladies that are going to be joining me. Um, the first is Christy Koslow. Um, Christy used to work with me at MediaVest, and currently now she is the Director of Marketing Technology at ConAgra Food. So please join me in welcoming Christy. Yeah, you can have a spot. <laughs> and then um, next is Elena Parlator. Elena used to work with me at Digitas um, and spent time also working with me at Kraft. Um, and currently she is the Senior Director of Consumer Relations at PepsiCo on the North American Nutrition Brands, which means Quaker, Tropicana, and Naked, as well as many other innovations and products that are being launched. So thanks for joining Thank you, Elena. Um, so I thought um, both of you have different titles. It's not just like, you know, head of media or head of social marketing. Um, could you each maybe take a quick minute just to tell us about your background and what your role currently is at your company? Me first. You sure. got it. All right. Um, again, my name is Christy Caslow. I'm currently the director of marketing technology at ConAgra. First of all, does anybody know who ConAgra is? Well, some of you. Okay, so ConAgra is a house of brands, if you will. We have brands like Slim Jim, Marie Callender, um, Healthy Choice, a lot of them. There's about 54 brands that we own. Um, so it is a CPG, um, similar to the experience we'll have up here. Um, I actually started my career in media, which is actually where I met uh, Dana. And as media evolved to be very data and technology focused, it opened up some opportunities for me um, that are really interesting, specifically in CPG, I would say, because there are some... Um, industries where data is flowing freely. Ours um, were a little bit challenged when it comes to data, and so it uh, took a bit of creativity to do the things that we need to do, um, and that has uh, given me an expertise within the organization that has become, um, I would say, valuable across the enterprise, not just in marketing anymore, which is why they've kind of moved me out of a marketing role and into, I actually sit in insights and analytics now. Awesome. Um, Elena Parlator, I work at PepsiCo within the nutrition brand. So those of you that don't know, I think Dana said Quaker, Tropicana, Naked Juice, Kavita most recently. Um, and currently work in consumer relations. So the senior director there, um, it's been new for me. It's about six months old, um, previously about 15 plus years in marketing. So um, consumer relations, for those of you who don't know, um, is we do one-to-one -one communications with consumers. We're answering questions, we're fielding concerns. We are operating in all channels, so from social to digital, and then I also lead the Digital Center of Excellence for all of PepsiCo as it relates to our one-to-one -one communications with consumers. So um, what led me here is long career in marketing, e-commerce, digital. When I worked with Dana, we, I worked um, the agency side at Kraft, a, a small stint there, worked on Sarah Lee, worked at Whirlpool, so lots of agency and client side experiences that led me to this role. Great, well, I'm so glad you could both join me. I've got a number of questions um, for these ladies, but we're going to take some time towards the end um, for any of you who might have questions. Um, so you can feel free to ask them you know, further insight about some of the things they've talked about or shared or some other things that might be on your mind. Um, but first, um, it, we're really here to talk about how digital technology and platforms are truly evolving and shaping a new way that consumers are purchasing. It's not just the traditional funnel model. I think that's kind of been blown up. Um, so lots has been evolving and changing. And in fact, consumers are leaving digital breadcrumbs everywhere. Anytime they go on the web, they use their phone, and all of those yield clues about intent and purchase behavior. Um, Christy, can you talk to me about how ConAgra is gathering and using data to guide their marketing decisions? Sure. Um, so we've got a ton of data sources, um, not all of them are usable, right? So from a marketing perspective, we need user-level data. 
Um, and so from a sales perspective, we've always been challenged. Our sales come through retailers who aren't always willing to share the data, or we have to buy it from an aggregator. So that data is great. We know that they buy, but we don't really know that much about them. So um, we have a website called Ready, Set, Eat, um, which we haven't spent a whole lot of time, I would say, supporting, although the um, intent to support it is becoming larger and larger as we know we need more information on consumers that we own, um, especially with uh, data sources being pulled from us left and right these days. Um, and so we are leveraging first-party data first, right? That we will take any information. We do have a newsletter, so there's some first-party PII data within there. Uh, we also have unknown um, data in the consumers that are coming to our website. So, like I said, we haven't really put a lot of dollars behind supporting that, but now with all of our advertising, we're going to be driving to those websites, which means we're going to have even more signals um, to target off of. Um, and we'll be able to target off those signals and go cross-channel, right? So we can do um, via, we have a data management platform, we can do that uh, via programmatic, and we're finding more and more ways to get it direct to our 360 partners. Um, we also have that going to social. Um, then we have second party data partnerships that have been fantastic um, and that's actually where I spend a lot of my time is determining who has first party data that I could really use and forging partnerships there directly so that I have that um, tends to be more effective, um, not always more efficient but more effective uh, which ultimately will, will lead to that efficiency number but um, in, in terms of it being observed behavior um, versus inferred. When, I, when we buy the third-party data, which we will continue to buy because that has the largest amount of scale, um, we do find that sometimes the uh, quality of that data isn't great. Mostly, number one, there's transparency. Number two, you have a lot of data sources who are um, inferring behavior, um, like saying things like, this is a millennial audience. Uh, when you dig into it and you actually run it, it might be someone who is much older. Um, but because they purchase things like a millennial, we call them millennials in that data set. Um, and so that's kind of the intent and the, the evolution of data. We started really heavy in the third. We're moving more towards second and first today and leveraging technology to disperse our messaging. Great. Elena, could you yeah. tell me how you're using it for your brands? Yeah, and to build off, actually, Christy said, we are rich in first-party data and consumer relations. So actually, consumers are contacting us all the time, telling us, um, asking questions, and we're gathering a lot of data on them. Um, actually, moving from marketing, it's been making the connection between that richness of data and the marketers and what they need to leverage and power all that marketing. So we're the ones getting it. It's not necessarily to the scale of a third party, but it's super rich. It's, it's address, it's name, it's reason for contact. So we're getting a lot of richness. It's then how do we kind of collect that in a way that's usable and then port it to the rest of the organization. So we're finding there's a lot of reasons to open the door to conversations internally and, um, and that that's a really amazing piece of data for CPG that you know retail has long known and seen that where marketing and consumer relations have this great handheld relationship. We're trying to build that more and more at PepsiCo. Cool. So what types of platforms are marketing tech providers are important to you and you know where are you looking at investments or making and protecting investments so I can start that one. Um, so for us, it's all about the 360 view of the consumer. So do we know what else um, they're buying? What else we're capturing on them? What else can we append to that data? So um, we do have a solution internally that works really well for our needs, but then we actually have to extend that out. We're working with partners like an Epsilon um, CRM database to make sure that we're using a lot of that data. Those are really important to us. I know on the marketing side, the DMP stuff, stuff that Christy can talk about, but for us, it's really 360 view of that consumer. If they call us on the phone, if they email us, if they leave a review, how do we know that's the same person? And how do we connect those data points for great insights? So yeah, for us, we are making a push more towards CRM, um, in which case we also have consumer relations data, but I'm going to guess that Elena's further along in using it than we are. Um, that is a great place for us to start, and, and we are investing in the consumer experience suite right now. Um, so we do have pieces of what you would consider a consumer experience suite. So we have a DMP, we have email. We've never really integrated it together because those two functions were separate up until very recently. Um, and so we are working on building more bridges together and actually integrating the tools so that everybody can use them and we can move the data back and forth a little bit more seamlessly. And um, 
that is a challenge. It is a it's a huge behavior shift, um, especially at CPG. That that you know, our CPGs were built at least the ones that I've worked at or for, um, to service the retailers, not necessarily to service consumers. And so we're kind of trying to make the shift um, in making it all about the consumer without having the infrastructure to be all about the consumer. And so it's going to start with the technology, and we're going to start bridge bridging those, those gaps, um, but also leveraging CRM, true mm -hmm. CRM data that we have, um, and starting to connect all of that together. Cool. So you mentioned um, that you're using data in different ways and even in social efforts. Um, do you think differently about what types of data you use to de deploy and power communication across channels? Like, it, Do you think differently about data and social channels? Do I think differently? No. Do I have to use it differently? Yes. But that's because you can't. There's not one seamless way to get that same data set across the ecosystem today. Um, I have to employ it differently on Facebook than I have to employ it differently on Pinterest. It's job security, really, but it's really <laughs> painful um, all day long. But there's so many different techniques that you have to use in order to get them to places. It's, it's been quite an, uh, a learning experience. Um, what technique or, or partner are you spending less time with than you maybe used to a couple years ago from a, a data or a tech standpoint? say banners, anybody display has gone down quite a bit. I mean, it's not that I'm, I'm working with the partners any less, it's that I'm, I'm deploying their tools differently. Okay. So it's still the same partners that we would have used for display, except most of my budget is either native or video with that same partner that it once was significantly heavy on display. And that could change as we make our website shoppable, um, which is something that we're doing. So if we want to talk about more technology, there's another you know, piece of technology is making every recipe on our site, um, give it the ability to add to cart immediately. Um, as we do that, there might be more reasons to do more display. If, if somebody was just on the site looking at a recipe, absolutely, I want to use a banner just to get in front of them. Um, that is probably the 2.0 version or second half of this fiscal for us. Great. Lena? Phone calls are going down for us, <laughs> not digital, but consumers are contacting us less. They're doing a lot of self-service. They're figuring out how to answer their questions on their own. So for us, we're getting a lot less of the traditional channels, hence my role also job security, knowing the digital space, knowing where consumers are leaving their feedback. So um, for us, it's shifting in the same way. How many letters do you get? Not very many anymore. You we do, some of them, like yeah. a Quaker, you still get letters. Yeah. Yep. This one's in the demographic. <laughs> Um, getting the right content to the right person at the right time, that's really nirvana, right? And that's you know, why we're all trying to learn, empower, and use data. Um, have you been able to get to true personalization in your efforts? And how, if so, how are those performing? I think it's a great question. Um, when my marketing roles, especially PepsiCo, we were doing a kind of baby step version of it where we were trying to think through the various constituents that we were targeting and what the different messaging would be. And I would say we did it at like a 1.0 level where we maybe had four different versions of creative and we were going out to four different audience segments. Transitioning into this job, I've been really impressed with the ability of teams to take one standard message and literally customize it by person. So you're taking a phone call, you're reading a letter, you have one standard stock answer potentially, and then it's up to you or the person on our frontline team to kind of cater that to that person. And I've been really impressed with watching those teams work. Um, kind of that whole role of personalization is happening um, at the consumer relations end. And I've learned a lot as a marketer, just watching the teams work and operate, and then taking that back to the marketers is like, here's a couple five easy ways that you can take the same message and make it customizable to a different consumer, which um, I think has been really powerful. I think we're also still just figuring out that, that bridge between us and marketing. But um, yeah, CR's been doing it for years. Yep. From a uh one to one, no. One to many, we've we've been better at. It's certainly easier in display, which I told you we're doing a whole lot of, less of. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're trying to figure out how to execute a one to many within a video. Um, technology, you know, there are partners out there that say they can do it, but when we try it, it's not really there yet from a dynamic creative optimization perspective. Um, we're not quite at the point where I can say this consumer cares about health and swap out an image or something else in a video. We're not there. Um, but we do feel there is a value in at least more than a couple messages because 
a, a woman 25 to 54 has 10 different reasons to purchase something. It's not about her demo, it's about her intent. Um, and so we've employed so many strategic theories internally. Uh, jobs theory is one of them that we, we talk about a lot um, in terms of finding something, um, the reason why someone hires a product um, and trying to uncover the multiple reasons and the largest opportunities for us to talk about our brand in that way. Great, interesting. Um, well, let's move over to the world of e-commerce and digital content and mobile. Um, it's really an interesting time. Consumers, I think, are more empowered than ever. Um, and it's not us choosing what we broadcast to them. It's really consumers choosing what information and, and what brands they want to go purchase instead of just what's put in front of them on the store or at the TV. Um, and it's really tied to the power and the immediacy of their mobile devices. Um, so I'm curious how this has changed, how consumers find and get information about your brands. Yeah, I'll take that one first. So um, e-commerce is transforming. PepsiCo has made a huge investment in um, e-commerce. It's all over the news. It's not anything um, anything private. But I think that's helped us to create this renewed focus on a consumer that is immediate, that um, all of our information is available at these online retailers and customers. And it's now up to us to connect to those customers, provide the right information. And um, mobile devices do help. I mean, a lot of consumers are still not necessarily open to buying groceries on e-commerce. So it's kind of finding the, what's the right channel solution for each of the consumers that come to us. For us, e-com is a very large focus um, and not necessarily because we think we're going to be direct to consumer anytime soon. We know that our customers or our consumers are really buying from our customers. There's a CPG thing for you. Um, and we really have to focus in on each individual retailer and how they're, um, how they're executing e-com, whether it's true e-com like an Amazon or if it's a um, click and collect via Kroger. I'm probably using the wrong terms, don't tell anyone, but they are all called something different um, for each of the retailers. And what we found was we, didn't not, we were a little bit late to the party, I would say, and, and likely because we have so many frozen brands. And so when we started this, when everybody started talking about e-com, it wasn't relevant for half of our portfolio. But with things like Click and Collect, it is very relevant. Um, and as you're seeing from a retail perspective, a loss of just one or two percentage points um, within e-com can really kill a business. And so that focus for us is now making sure that every retailer website, however they are, are um, focusing in on e-com, that we do it right on there. We have the right images. We have the right copy. Um, everything is, we're working towards automating all of these things to make it easier because we have so many retailers. Um, and so that's a big focus and we've actually restructured the whole marketing team um, and actually restructured the way that team functions. At a CPG, there's usually a sales organization, a shopper marketing organization, a brand marketing person, a brand person. There are so many different people. And what we're trying to do from an e-com perspective is eliminate that, those silos and have one person actually go soup to nuts. Um, which has been really helpful and it's been driving a lot quicker change than maybe in some other areas. Cool. Yeah. I just uh, want to add to, I think it's awesome because you get the immediate feedback on e-commerce sites. Mm -hmm. Like in Amazon, like a consumer can leave a question and say, hey, your product information is wrong. And that's kind of what I love about that feedback loop. It's instant. You can go right to the marketing team and say, your content's wrong. It needs to say this. Or I need to know how to prep that product. You haven't listed it. Like they'll send it to us and we have to immediately react, which is also great, that hand-holding. So um, thinking about that, you know, information that comes from an e-commerce standpoint, how are you thinking about ratings and reviews for your brands? And are they important? Are you investing in this space or thinking through this? Yeah, I mean, we, on the nutrition brands, yes, yeah, super important. A consumer shopping for a nutrition-based brand is very interested in a lot of the nitty-gritty details about the product. Um, they want to know if it's specialized for a specialized diet. Does it have allergens? So um, consumers leaving us their feedback and thoughts on the products are super important. And um, I think it fuels this great always-on engine of continually improving the content that you have, the messaging you have, feedback on your product. So we've seen the power of it. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to maintain, I'm not gonna lie. It's actually really hard to maintain all of, for especially an old CPG brand, a lot of SKUs, a lot of products, a lot of details. So um, a lot of that has uh, kind of migrated to our team, which is great, because we're continually updating that work, taking the information, sending it back to consumers. Um, so it's been, it's been really helpful. 
I can't really speak to the, the focus on e-com uh, rating and reviews because I'm not on that um, team. But from a recipe site website, absolutely, ratings and reviews. But it is very difficult um, to maintain. But we know that the highest reviews ones are the, probably the ones that are going to get the most traction. Um, great. So I'm curious, you know, in your personal opinion, do you think of Amazon or e-commerce sites as an opportunity for that you know, call to action shopper messaging, or is it an opportunity for brand awareness? Or is it both? both. I got a both too. Um, yeah, I think it has power in both. I mean, there are so many consumers visiting amazon.com. Like, it's just a powerhouse for awareness as well as that conversion journey. So, I mean, if you can convert someone right on one website, it's kind of the nirvana, especially um, in CPG. So, I think it's powerful. It's scary that one retailer has that much power over an industry and several industries. But um, I think, as Chrissy talked about, it's it's really mobilizing to to play their game at this point. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, well, going back to mobile um, for a second, I, you know, as we think about how, how frequently consumers are using mobile devices, is that changing how you think about the consumer experiences you build or the technologies you're using to create and distribute content or, or even how you're thinking about gathering data in terms of that broad mobile usage? Um, sure. So from a mobile perspective, in terms of advertising, I would say we're baby stepping our way into changing a full consumer experience. However, we've seen that our advertising itself, we, we used to back in the day, would, would say, oh, this consumer we're going after is, is heavy on mobile or light on mobile and then determine a percentage to actually um, allocate with the advertising. And instead now it's more of a channel or a, a device agnostic approach in which then you can see actually that your ads are delivering way heavier on, on mobile just because that's where your consumers are. Um, in terms of gathering data, um, it does certainly open the opportunity for us to um, strengthen our identity graph if we can get consumers on mobile to go to our website because now we can capture it. Um, and so those are the types of conversations that we have um, first in gathering the data so we can, we can get more intelligent about what we do. And I think the next step from there is how we use that data um, to customize our, our creative message or our experience. And for us mobile, it starts at the top too internally is driven that it's our one and only channel. So a lot of focus goes to simplifying experiences so they can be experienced on mobile. So we've just launched um, some new contact pages, which is when a consumer has a question, they come to those and they are mobile first. You can literally tap a button, use natural language search, speak into it. Um, so we're trying to be start with mobile and say, you know what, actually simplifying the experience is going to help the mobile consumer. And then when you go on desktop, it's, it's just even that much more seamless. So it's a hard change to make. Um, but once you kind of adopt that mentality, it actually is easier throughout. Um, and we've also seen that kind of manifest in um, most of our consumer inquiries are about where to buy the products, which is, is great because um, you know consumers have a demand for it, they want to buy it. And so we're starting to think through how do we adapt that where to buy experience where you don't even need to enter into your zip code. It knows exactly where you are and it can tell you that location um, that's a couple blocks away. Or it can say, you know what, you want to buy it online, it's a quick one tap add to cart. So it's defining a lot of the way that we're bringing to life these simplified consumer experiences. Yep, I love it. Simple, right? Simplicity. I had spent some time with Google before and we had done some testing um, and they really gave me a different perspective of thinking through mobile and remembering not everybody is operating at warp speed Wi-Fi, um, which we may or may not be using right now in this conference room when there's a lot of people on Wi-Fi. Sometimes it slows down, but you know when you think about the rest of the country, you have to remember that not all your consumers are always operating on the fastest speed. And so to look at your experiences and think about them from a simplicity standpoint, as well as speed and capability in terms of what they might be operating at. So it's totally interesting to think about the mobile world and people's chubby thumbs <laughs> and speed. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Um, well, what type of content marketing needs do you think that marketers need to prepare for in today's digital age where consumers are in control, they're looking for content on their own, um, you know, they're using their mobile phones. How has that changed what kind of content you might have gone into market with before? Um, so this has been a real change for us, and it's still a, a difficult one, but we very much have always been a point of difference marketer. 
all of our creative was about why, what, why do people buy Red Whip? What, where's my point of difference? It was really hard to get those experiences. I would say Slim Jim has probably done the best job of um, actually, you know, breaking out and not talking about a meat stick versus mm -hmm. jerky, right? They actually do have a personality. And so uh, we're pushing more towards that, that brand, not necessarily, I don't want to use the word purpose because that kind of implies something higher than what we're talking about, but just not always talking about that single most important thing, the smit, as we used to call it. Um, and so we're working way more towards what a consumer actually cares about and something that, that provides a consumer either utility or entertainment. It's got to be something uh, greater than buy Pam um, because of non-residue, which that doesn't mean anything to anyone except for our, our top 5% of consumers. And then uh, similar, but we have so much feedback from consumers. It's actually hard to sift through it and figure out what's bubbling up to the top. Um, and then get that to override kind of the very cyclical customer focus too that we have that's very similar. So we have these big promotions, we have big tentpole events. They're just things that the marketing teams work on to blast out and that works for our customers, but it doesn't necessarily work for our consumers. So it's figuring out how do we take the, all of the individual perspectives of consumers that give us feedback and say, what do we think are the nuggets that we wanna pull out and see are, are relevant to other consumers? So um, it's been kind of a personal mission from our team to sift through that feedback and give it in very digestible pieces to the marketing teams to say, here's your most valuable areas of content. Now that works for a product and market, it doesn't work for an innovation. So it's kind of been a push and pull on what do we do for innovations where we're doing a very traditional testing model to understand good messaging. But I think it's the best conversation to have now with marketers and with the teams we're working with. Um, so that is kind of bleeds into another area I wanted to ask you about which is how are you using digital technology and, and social platforms to gather information and factor that into your marketing and consumer relations? Like, are you using social intelligence tools? What kind of role do they play within your organization? Yeah, so we're doing a lot to listen to consumers across um, social. So when they're maybe mentioning us, maybe not mentioning us, we do a lot of social listening. We offer it as a service to our brands. Um, it's been real interesting on those that take us up on it and um, find value in terms of feeding innovation, feeding marketing plans. Um, and then we also monitor all of our own channels. So it's really fascinating also what consumers come and tell you on your Facebook page, on your Instagram channel. Um, they tell you everything, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, but it's great to be the team that's listening, reacting, providing feedback, giving the, the teams back responses. Um, but it's just a wealth of information that you're getting from these big brands and from little brands too. Like you'd be surprised how much feedback you get on a small brand that maybe you're not spending a lot of money on advertising to, but has a lot of rich, loyal following. Chef Boyardee for us. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, it's for us, Jan Jemima. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Mexico and Jan Jemima, yeah. but lots of feedback. Lots yep. Um, so we do social listening. We kind of always have, I would say, that the role of social listening has evolved over time. Um, all of the brands, you know, we had PR agencies doing social media for us. We, we actually have a lot of agencies doing a lot of different things for us. Um, the social listening that they would do, though, we kind of found... Um, They'd be listening for things, but sometimes maybe listening for things that they wanted to hear to sell a story to us so that we could get some of the content done. Um, we're trying to bring that more into a centralized fashion so that we can actually truly hear what consumers are saying, figuring out which brands or if there's an opportunity to actually activate something off of that. Um, and it's spreading even more broadly. So that's just from a marketing perspective to try and get some creative learnings. And maybe um, there's a new trend in health eating um, that, that is starting to pop and so maybe we're going to have a conversation internally. Now that conversation isn't just within marketing, it moves over to the innovation team, it moves into the insights team to say, is this a real thing? Um, can we do some research there? So um, it's getting better and better, I would say, um, in terms of being a centralized capability for the organization. Cool. Um, well, I have one last area to talk about quickly and then we'll open up the floor if you folks have questions. Um, but I'm curious about um, other areas of digital innovation um, that are starting to grow and bleed, things like Alexa and artificial intelligence and chatbots. You know, how are your organizations looking at the, these types of tools and technology that consumers are starting to adopt? And in fact, my kids, not even me, sometimes it's, you know, I find it's the, the teenagers and 
you know, who are all putting it on their Christmas list and asking for these things and, and starting to shop and think about brands in a whole different way. But how are you, how are you guys looking at Alexa and chatbots and AI? So on the nutrition brands, we've been doing some experimenting. We have an Alexa skill um, for Quaker Oats. So if you do have an Amazon Alexa, just ask her to open Quaker. Um, it teaches you how to make overnight oats and energy bites. And that started as a marketing idea. Um, it was to pony off of a campaign where you're launching a new product. And we said, what's the, a great way to engage consumers around the new technology? So it had a reason for being. I think it's a wonderful manifestation of something of utility that's interesting. Do we get a lot of uses out of it? No. Um, do we have anything to benchmark it again? No. <laughs> but it's one of those things that strategically was a great, wonderful add-on to a campaign, getting out a message of this new way to use oats and, and this new way to educate consumers on it. So I think strategically we've been using it um, as a, a marketing tactic um, to leverage in a different area and then also it helps your customer relationships as well with an Amazon. Um, what we've been experimenting more recently with is um, chatbot AI. So um, working around how do we automate some of the stuff that is easy to answer for consumers. So on Facebook, Messenger, how can you answer some of those low-hanging fruit questions like where do I buy this product or um, tell me which recipe is best for me. So those are the types of things we're experimenting with. What AI tends to make you do is think through your own logic to then train it to do the same thing which has been a great exercise for us and for marketers because it makes you think about how would I make this decision of what to tell a consumer and then how do I program AI to think through that same tree. Um, but it's been a really good exercise, I think, to think through some of those executions and how do you make it really useful for a consumer. So the last thing we want to do is replace a human that was giving excellent service with a bot that's really frustrating you. So a, a bit has been a balance. Where do you tell the bot to stop and get you right to a human? Um, and then where can you continue to let a bot provide that sort of intelligence? We talk about it a lot. Um, I would say, have we executed too much? No, but there's a lot of conversations and different utilities, I think, that, that the voice, and specifically, we always talk about Alexa, but, but when we have those conversations, it is meant more broadly. Um, for us, uh, our website's really small. Do we want to develop a skill that you know, a very small amount of consumers would do, or do we want to push partnerships with some of the skills that have larger audiences? I think that's probably the route we're going to go. Um, but it's hard because you know, a lot of people are going after those same partnerships. It's just we have to strike the right balance and find um, the right partner to work with us. But certainly if you think through any of the other recipe sites that are larger, when, when a consumer is, is using the platform, I'll use Meredith as an example, it will give you step by step, and we would love for it to recommend, obviously, our brands in there. Um, and so we'll see that. And it's the same thing with Amazon um, and, and trying to forge a partnership that's large enough where you can say, um, hey, Alexa, put cooking spray on my list and would love to say add Pam cooking spray. I mean, that, that's the holy grail right there. Um, and getting in there first is, is the way to to expand that relationship. Um, I'll give an example that has driven me nuts since we worked together on craft. Um, <laughs> was on Meredith, if you ever notice, there's one tip and it says something about aluminum foil. It's been on there for years and I've never known how Reynolds got that. It was Reynolds, I think, that forged yep. that partnership. It doesn't even say Reynolds, but you know that the tip is on every recipe that says <laughs> aluminum foil can avoid, you know, help you clean up messes or avoid stick. And, it, and I wish that I was the person that thought of that, but it's been there for years and it won't go away. And, and as somebody who's worked on Pam, I'm like, how do I get that on the next big platform? And that's the holy grail, I'd say. Get rid of that foil. Damn it. <laughs> get rid of that foil. Meat sticks have personality. <laughs> Christy, you are full of wisdom today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, how about if we open up to the floor <coughs> and see what kind of questions you guys might have for these two ladies or even for myself? Yep, we've got a question in the back. Okay, well, I'm glad that you're all here because I am in the grocery retail world. Um, so I work for Damon, um, and I have a client who is a retailer and a wholesaler, and my challenge this year and probably for the next couple of years is figuring out how do I convince my small retail groups who are my B2B client to start advertising digitally so that they're not losing all of these young millennial families that are coming up, and these are like podunk retail groups, you know, middle of the nation and not a lot of money. Um, how do you get them to start 
advertising digitally and switch that spend from like a traditional print media to Facebook, to Google, to you know wherever you want to use it, and get them the answer that they always ask, which is how do I know that spending you know a couple grand on Facebook is going to translate into sales in my store? It, it, are you guys seeing anything like down the pipeline where we're going to be able to get that kind of data or be able to kind of open up that I don't know that whole universe because that that's something we've been struggling with for the last couple of years. We're we're able to do it with our retail stores, you know, through loyalty programs and things like that. But um, when you don't control it. Well, how are they quantifying print? It, that's that's always my answer. Okay. Is you know you you had that impression that landed on your doorstep or your customer's doorstep, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they walked in the door right. and, and bought that thing from you. But um, but they seem to think that because it's technology, it should just be able to do that. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm wondering what you guys are seeing, you know, trending or possibly yep. coming up. I mean, I think a lot of us have had to like, you know, prove the case. And it's, you know, de defining KPIs and goals of, you know, what a test needs to be. And, you know, sometimes thinking about a test not being too tiny, you need to make sure it has enough scale to get some level of results. Um, but setting some KPIs, um, if you aren't able to work with like a Nielsen or an IRI to get purchase data because of scale or just size of budget because that would cost you to get purchase data to measure. Um, you know, you could think about other kind of leading indicators that, you know, that show reach um, and engagement, but you know, things like viewability, things like you know, impressions or engagement, you know, if you have an, a call to action, you know, if you include a coupon and how many clicks on the coupon, you know, even if you can't exactly tie it to the, the, the sales purchase, um, you know, think about those ways that you can either create some indicators or some KPIs and track against that. I think that's a difficult ask for you, too. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes we've had to get um, organizations excited about the creative, too, because, you know, in certain traditional channels, like very familiar with the creative process, what works on a print page too. So what it's been is a lot of educating and here's the variety of ways you could execute creative. So we've also approached it like that way instead of like also just always metrics is like, what are the different ways you can experiment with different creative? How can you get excited about showcasing it? So that also goes a long way. If you can show it on a mobile phone and they can bring it up and demo it to each other. Like I find sometimes that works internally when logic doesn't prevail. <laughs> raise your hand every time you're in a meeting and they're on their phone. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was going to say, you know what you could do is tell them if they can spend a day without their phone or a week without their phones, then, you know, you can have a media budget and not spend anything on digital. Yeah. But like, honestly, like kind of like force them to also see where their time and attention is and, you know, even do some little things of like go into a grocery store and like, you know, within half an hour, like how many pictures can you take of somebody on a phone or, you know, little things like that that just kind of prove your point, you know. Um, another question here? This message, oh, this is for Christy. Uh, you mentioned about uh, using CRM that you're having issues with connectivity, with it talking to other things, to other, other programs. What tools are you using to bridge those gaps and what programs are you using for your CRM and for your email campaigns? So CR CRM's a challenge again because we only have, I would say, 3.5 million records. I say only, and I apologize, for a large CPG brand that's, that's really small. Um, when we have 95% household penetration, 3.5 million is pretty small. But um, right now, to bridge it into advertising, so you go from that known consumer to anonymous, um, because it's not integrated right now, it's done via match table and or onboarder. So there's a lot of data loss between the two. Um, the goal is to integrate the systems, which costs a lot of money. It's very difficult to do because we have to bring someone else in that has that expertise to, to build the pipes, even when you're buying you know, two products from the same suite. They don't actually integrate. It takes millions of dollars to actually integrate it. Um, so unfortunately, right now, it is fairly manual, um, but the hope is that the technology will be there. I would say the CDP is the new buzzword, right, the consumer data platform um, that's supposed to solve that. I, um, we're not quite in the place where we're truly vetting it, but that's probably the next step for us that, that would actually give you all of that data to be able to activate off of um, in more real time. Yeah, I think the CDP is also interesting. A number of CPG marketers tend to be 
more compressed with some of our, our dollars these days against non-working investments. So in this space, you could consider some of the investment on connecting all the dots to be working media or help your working media, but finance and accounting might think it is not and classify it differently. And you know those are budgets that are really constrained. Um, and so it's finding those ways and those partners who can help you make your buck go further and sometimes focusing more on one provider, whether it's a Salesforce, an Oracle, or um, Adobe to make your dollars go a little further. Awesome. Well, there you go.